<laughs> now, you can see how there's a dovetailing between the storage procedure, the learning procedure, and the retrieval plan. And most mnemonics have that kind of nice dovetailing. Sigmund Freud was the first to recognize that what we remember and what we choose to forget can help maintain our sense of integrity and self-esteem. Freud labeled the process repression, in which the ego is defended against unacceptable thoughts and information by pushing them out of awareness, by repressing them, and storing them in the realm of the unconscious. But some of them, says Freud, will struggle free and show up in disguised form, in dreams, slips of the tongue, and symptoms of mental distress. Some memories are made more meaningful to us by what's called the constructive process of remembering. To make new information fit better with what we already know and believe, we accentuate some details, eliminate some, and reinterpret others. In this way, we construct consistent themes and coherent stories, even from information that is inconsistent and ambiguous. These two processes form a central principle of memory. How and what you remember is determined by who you are and what you already know. There's an awful lot of people and information to take in here on any given day. But how much of it will I remember? As we've seen, the answer is going to depend not only on how much I concentrate and how many distractions there are, but also on who I am and what I already know. But how will all these factors translate into the actual functioning of my memory? Well, the answer has to do with something called schemas. Schemas are frameworks of our basic ideas and preconceptions about people, objects, and situations. All the new information we learn is organized by relating it to existing schemas. And many of our constructions of memory and distortions arise as we try to fit new information into old schemas. How much would you be able to recall about what is in this office? In an experiment to demonstrate the power of schemas, subjects spent a few minutes in this room. Later they were questioned about its contents. The subject's recall was strongly influenced by their schema of what a typical office contains. They correctly recalled items that matched those of the office schema, did less well recalling items that weren't part of the schema, and falsely remembered items that are usually in offices but aren't in this one. Schemas also influence our perception and understanding of the world. The San Francisco artist Franco Magnani painted this scene of the Italian town where he was born entirely from memory. He hasn't seen the town since he left it, some 30 years ago. Now compare some of his other paintings with these recent photos of the town as it really is, a town that has hardly changed. Although many details are accurately recalled, some are distorted by a child's perspective by Magnani's boyhood schema. At work here are the dual memory processes of remarkable accuracy and significant distortions. Ongoing research about memory is leading psychologists to many discoveries about its nature. But beyond theories about how memory works or doesn't work is the physical reality of the process. When something is remembered, there's a corresponding physical change in the brain itself. Memories make lasting alterations in the structure and functioning of the central nervous system. Every bit of information you acquire in your lifetime is encoded in the neurons of the brain. These memory traces or engrams make up the biological substrate of human memory. One set of engrams forms the foundation of everything you know how to do, the procedural knowledge behind every skilled action. Another set embodies what you know, your so-called semantic or declarative knowledge from the world of concepts, ideas, and things. And yet another batch of engrams works in the service of your episodic memory, your diary of personal experiences, each tagged with a time and a place, when, 
and where it happened. Functioning together, these engrams establish your individual, personal perspective on life. But where exactly are these engrams? What is the anatomy of memory? The search for the engram began some 40 years ago with psychologist Carl Lashley. Using rats as subjects, Lashley trained them to learn mazes, then removed portions of the cerebral cortex and retested their memories. He found that memory suffered as more brain tissue was removed, but it didn't seem to matter what part of the cortex he took the tissue from. Lashley concluded that memory was not localized in any specific area of the brain. He may have been right for complex memories, but he was wrong about simple memories. Others continued in the search for the elusive memory engram. Among them was Richard Thompson of the University of Southern California. Using rabbits as subjects, Thompson has succeeded in finding one of the memory engrams by tracing the circuitry of the brain involved in conditioning and remembering. Thompson uses iBlink classical conditioning. A tone is synchronized with a slight puff of air to a rabbit's eye, which elicits a reflexive blink. With a number of pairings of these two stimuli together, the animal develops a conditioned response, a learned response, a memory, if you will, so that it, it blinks to the tone before the air puff occurs. After the animal has been trained, we will then make a very small lesion in the region that we think contains the memory trace, and that very small lesion will abolish permanently the memory for this conditioned response. The memory traces for these learned responses that we study appear to be stored in very localized regions right here in this little structure within the cerebellum called the interpositus nucleus. This is a recording of the eyelid response itself. So time is going this way, tone comes on, and there's no response at all to the tone. Air puff to the eye, a reflex eye blank, eye closure, strictly a reflex, before learning has occurred. The tone comes on at this point in time, and you'll notice that there is a very well-developed eyelid closure response that peaks about the time of onset of the air puff. There is then a reflex response to the air puff itself. This is the conditioned response. After the surgery, we can see that the memory for the learned response is completely obliterated. All that's left is the reflex response, the same response the animal gave at the beginning of training before it had learned the conditioned response. So we feel that as we come to understand how the brain stores memories, we will be able to develop new techniques and new tools to deal with memory disorders. So that's a very practical and I think now realizable goal. Thompson's work was the basis for the research of Diana Woodruff Pock at Temple University. Woodruff Pock has pioneered the use of eye blink classical conditioning methods on humans as a means of detecting early onset dementia, such as Alzheimer's, in older adults. The idea that eye blink classical conditioning might um, detect Alzheimer's disease was derived from the animal model, the rabbit model. Scopolamine is a drug that impairs acetylcholine transmission. Acetylcholine is really the memory neurotransmitter. Alzheimer's disease devastates the acetylcholine neurotransmitter system. The reason that memory impairment is the number one system of Alzheimer's disease is probably this acetylcholine connection. Your ears, and you're going to feel some puffs of air in your eye that are going to make you blink. I don't want you to try to blink. So to my blink. hypothesis was that relax, patients with Alzheimer's relax, disease relax. would have this disrupted hippocampus, this impairment of the acetylcholine, and would find it almost impossible to produce conditioned responses. And that is the case. We have what we think is a perfect case study for our hypothesis. This individual started working with us as a good conditioner. And the first time we tested her, she had something like 50% condition responses, even though she was 89 years old. We saw her again a couple years later, and she had 
really dramatically slipped and her eye blink conditioning score was below 25 percent condition responses. On the other hand, her scores on neuropsychological tests were normal and continued to be normal for another five years. So this was a case of an individual where eye blink conditioning showed impairment five years before tests that would be of declarative memory showed impairment. We're fortunate to have MRIs of this individual uh, five years apart and we showed about the time she had impaired eye blink conditioning her medial temporal lobes were showing deterioration and five years later the MRI showed major deterioration in medial temporal lobes. It's critically important to detect Alzheimer's disease early because even in the earliest stages when there are no clinical signs, neurons in the brain are dying. So you want to catch the person as early as possible to preserve as, as much of their brain as you can. If we could catch a person and keep their personality and their memory intact, this would be the ideal goal. Of course, even a, a greater goal, I guess, would be to prevent the disease entirely. Brain tissue atrophies. As more of the cortex is lost, so are the memories, then the personality, and eventually life itself. Don't you remember? Things are so mixed up. Life without memory is life without a past and a future. Throughout this program, we've looked at memory as the mind's most vital form of information processing. But there are many other higher order mental processes that make us what we are. Thinking, reasoning, planning, judging, deciding, problem solving. And they are all in the domain of cognitive psychologists who have transformed modern psychology. The Cognitive Revolution, next time. I'm Philip Zimbardo. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org. To learn more about the Annenberg CPB channel series and workshops for teachers, how to take them for credit, how to buy them on video cassette, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org/channel. The Annenberg CPB channel.